Welcome back to all our viewers. This week on Changing Tracks, we have a new passenger, Sister Rachel Newton, who is a servant sister of the home of the mother. Welcome, Sister Rachel. Thank you. Can you just tell us a little bit about yourself, how old you are, where you're from, mm -hmm. what your family is like, what your childhood was like, how you got here today? Okay, well, like you said, I'm Sister Rachel. I'm 22 years old, and I grew up in a town called Waldorf, Maryland. In my childhood, I grew up in a Catholic family, um, and it was a good childhood, more or less normal. Um, I remember when I was little, I'm the fourth of five children. And my dad, when I was little, he would take us every night and he'd put us in a circle and we'd all say prayers. Usually we'd say prayers for, please bless Arnie, please bless Peter, please bless Maria, like all our brothers and sisters. Yeah. And he would go and put his hand on each one of us. And I remember this with a lot of tenderness, like this was a really good time for me in my childhood. So that was basically it. But when I, when I started to get older, I had to go to public schools. But I lived in an area that wasn't very good. So that's when things kind of started to change. And my faith wasn't as important as it was. About what age was that? Middle school, that would be 14, 13 or 14 years old. So that changed from going from grade school to middle school, just threw things off? Yeah, um, I mean, since I had, since I grew up in the Catholic family, I knew what was right and what was wrong. And that was kind of in me, it was in my conscience, you know, I couldn't ignore it. But also, when you get older, you start to care more about your image. Like, I only wanted to have friends and to be popular, or and maybe not even be popular, but to have friends and have support, you know. Um, but where I'm from, there's a lot of drugs, there's a lot of gangs, there's a lot of fighting, those kinds of things. So I was kind of in a constant fight inside because I wanted to be bad so I could have friends, mm -hmm. but I knew I had to be good because it was in my conscience. Um, so that was kind of the thing for me. I was always fighting. I have to go with these friends or I have to stay and be alone, which I think a lot of people, a lot of kids are running into that right now because if they're not good, you can't be with your friends and you have to be alone. So that's, yeah, you've got to be in the in crowd. you got to do what everyone does. And yeah, and unfortunately, sometimes you have to make a choice. Either I'm alone or I'm with these friends and I have to do these things. So that's how it was in middle school. Um, and then I went to high school, which was even worse because <laughs> it, um, again, the environment was the same and I wanted to have friends and be with them. Um, and it, again, it was always the fight that I had inside. Um, in these years, I would say the four years of high school were probably the worst four years of my life because I just remember a lot of darkness and a lot of suffering. I remember a lot of nights I would just go into my room and close the door and cry and cry and cry and cry. And it didn't make sense to me. You guys say, what's wrong? Because I have friends, you know, like I have what I need. I'm not, I'm not lacking anything that I can tell. So what's wrong with me? <laughs> I don't get it, you know, like I don't know what I'm missing. Um, and the thing is with it's concerning my faith. I never stopped going to Mass on Sunday because my dad would make me, um, you know, my family was good. And, but they didn't know anything that was going on inside of me. So I kind of, it was kind of like a double life. Like my family saw me and I was fine and everything was okay. But, you know, at night you go and you close the door and you're there crying and you're in desperation, really. And when I think about this time, it's funny because I actually thought I was sick. I was tempted a lot to ask my parents to take me to the doctor because I thought I had some kind of mental problem because I was always sad. Mm -hmm. Even though I had everything, I was always sad. But, and that's not what I needed. <laughs> what I needed was God, That's because he wasn't in the center of my life and if he's not there, then that's how I'm gonna feel. Did you realize that in those years, that what you were needing was God? I think I always kind of, I could always, I always knew deep, deep, deep down that God would, was the answer to everything, that he was, I never stopped believing in God. A lot of my friends, yeah, they stopped believing in God, like my friends who are Catholic, um, because of the situations that they were in. A lot of them had really difficult family lives and it, they lost their faith completely, but I never did that. Um, it was a really, it's like a grace of God to, know, to never stop believing in God, like that's, that never happened to me. But. There was one priest who was really good and he would preach very strongly. And sometimes when I went to Mass, the things he said would touch my conscience. But other than that, I kind of, I don't, I was looking, for, I wanted to put myself in the world, you know, and look for, look for happiness there, which is what everyone <laughs> is doing. But So then did you finish high school all four years the same? Did you go to the, did you go to college after high school and mm -hmm. was there any changes there? 
Um, well, I finished high school and it was basically like I was living like that in depressions and this double life for the four years of high school. And so obviously I was in a really bad state by the end of it because you live like that for four years and you, you're really empty inside. But my dad, who is really, I'm very thankful for that he did this now, um, he told me, look, if you want me to pay for you, your university, you have to go to one of these eight schools that I choose because he wanted me to go to a good Catholic school because he, knew, he knows the influences out there in the state colleges. Um, and so I, was, I said, well, I'm not going to pay for it. I don't want to pay for college. You know, why, why wouldn't I take it? So I, okay. And so I looked at the list and I picked the one that was closest to the beach, that was nice and far away, you know, where I would like to go. It's because God could use anything. Like, mm -hmm. He could use our stupid little, like I wanted to go to the beach, you know, but he used that to bring me closer to him in the end. I didn't realize it at that point. Um, but so I picked that university and I went there and that's when things kind of started to change a little bit because obviously it's a Catholic school and the environment is better than where I was before so that immediately took me out of some of the things that I was in before. Was it just I mean instant did you start going to mass all the time was it a no. process <laughs> was it? <laughs> no well I, when I look back on it I see a lot of the providence of God because when you go there, I didn't know anyone at this university. Sometimes, you know, you go with your friends and you, you want a room together and so you sign up together. But I didn't know anyone, so I just got picked randomly with my roommate. And I had a really, really good roommate, a really good friend of mine. And she was a very good influence for me. And also, when I was in high school, I was always surrounded by people who were very... You know, they were in, in living in sin, you know, and so that's really... It affected me a lot more than I thought. And when I met this girl, this, this my roommate, I saw that she was a person who was very pure and she really, she she impressed me a lot and I said, wow, I kind of want to be like her, like, you know, she's great, like, I, I, we, we hit it off right away and we had a really good friendship. And she would invite me to things like daily mass, which I didn't even know that you could go to mass every day, I thought it was only Sunday because I had lack of formation. Um, and she would tell me to pray and all these things and I was like, oh yeah, okay, that's your stuff, whatever, because you're such a good girl, you know, like, it's good, but... But she really helped me a lot in her influence. Um, but also, that this was the fall semester and there, there was a retreat, a silent retreat. And one of my friends was telling me, like, you have to go on this retreat with me, you have to go. And I would never go on a retreat because I was never the, per I never wanted to go somewhere and pray. I thought it was just like weird to go on retreats. Um, but since my friend didn't leave me alone, and I was like, okay, I'll just go. Since it's silent anyway, I won't have to say anything to anyone. It doesn't matter. I'll just go. It's two days. Who cares? And so I went. I mean, this is one of the biggest graces of my life because the priests there, they preached very strongly the truth. And it was one of the first times I heard the truth, like the way that the young people need to hear it today. Just the straight up truth, no sugaring, you know, putting sugar on it to make it easier. And they said, this is what you have to live. This is what's right. This is what's wrong. And so the whole time I was there in the talks and I wanted to listen, but I didn't. I was kind of like, <laughs> like this, like, ah. Uh. But, you know, like, it was all touching my heart a lot. But the two days passed and it was really difficult. That's how it was for the two days. And I didn't change at all. I mean, I, but those things, kind they were like planting seeds in my heart, those, those two days. And so that was the fall semester. And then I went home for Christmas break. And what happened was my sister got married. And this actually helped me a lot because my sister, my poor sister, she suffered a lot for me because she had had a conversion when she went to university. And so she spent a lot of time trying to convert me and I never listened to her. I just made her suffer more and more. I'm sure she prayed a ton for me. Um, but I was the maid of honor at her wedding and I said it, I had to make the toast and I said it because it was so clear to me. I, I remember feeling a lot of joy, more joy than I had felt in a long, long, long time. And I said... Well, I know today that I'm feeling like this joy and this peace and my sister and her husband are feeling it also because they're doing what God wants because both of them had discerned their vocation. They were, they were more attentive to what God wants and not just what they wanted. And so I said it and even as I was saying it, I kind of realized, like, why don't you just be good? Like, why don't you change? Don't be stupid. <laughs> you know, like, you, you know what you have to do, just change. Because since I had the Catholic formation, I knew that I could go to confession, you know, I could start going to Mass, and my life would start to change. And that kind of rooted it in more like, you know what you have to do. And then after that, it was the spring semester. And again, I didn't really change anything. I kind of had these things in my heart, like, when are you going to do it? What do you, you know, like, you have to make the steps. Um, 
I kind of just, I got into a lot of friendships that were really clingy and not good for you. There's a lot, it's very easy to have unhealthy friendships, you know, when you just depend on each other and you use each other. You think you're so close and like, it's a great friendship, but it's really you're just using each other, you know. Um, and it wasn't helping me at all. But my roommate, my first roommate that I had had, she invited me to go on another retreat. It was the same one from the semester before, it's just they have it every semester. And so I said, okay. And this time I went with my heart a little bit more open, my attitude a little bit better. And I was actually going to listen and not close my ears at all. Um, and I remember that my sister, she had invited me years ago to go to her university and spend a couple of days with her and her friends. And she bought me a book. It's The Introduction to the Devout Life by Francis de Sales. And I never opened it, it was, but I always had it. <laughs> I never looked at it. Um, but in the, for the retreat, they said, bring a spiritual reading book or bring a notepad. You know? So I brought this book with me. So I have this. Um, and the whole time, it was, it was the experience that I had before of you know, hear, having these, hearing the truth and having it touch my heart, but not really wanting to do anything, but wanting to at the same time. Um, and one of the nights they had adoration with the Eucharist exposed. And I didn't really know what to do there. I was kind of just sitting there like, ah, you know, I don't know how to pray. <laughs> but um, I took the book that my sister had given me and I opened it. And it was, I opened it to the part about making a general confession. And I said, ah, oh, I didn't know that you could do that. Because a general confession is when you make a confession of your whole life. It's like a, it, of everything. And I realized that I hadn't been to confession in years. I had, couldn't remember how many years. I was, I, had, I was 18 at this time. Um, and I had stopped receiving the Eucharist because I knew that if you're in a state of mortal sin, you can't receive the Eucharist. And from all the, everything in high school and all that, I can't receive the Eucharist. But I wanted to, and it would touch me too because during these retreats, everyone would go up to receive the Eucharist, and I was the only one sitting there. Like, and it, I wanted to receive him, but I couldn't, you know. And so, I mean, the biggest grace I received from this retreat is the knowledge that okay, I have to go and make this general confession. I mean, I'm free to do it or not. But if I do it, I'm gonna change my. It's gonna change my life completely. That's. I felt a lot of urgency. Like, if I don't do this right now, I'm never gonna do it, and I'm gonna lose the opportunity. But if I do it, it's gonna change my life completely. Um. So, thanks be to God, He gave me the grace to do it. And so, we returned. It was a two-day retreat, and we returned Sunday night. Sunday night, I emailed the priest, and I said, because there's priests available on the campus. Um. And I said, look, I haven't confessed in a really long time, and I need. I feel that I need to make a general confession. And the next day, I met with him, and I did it. Thanks be to God. <laughs> and that was kind of like the big turning point. Um, and it's not even, I think people can have like a, a stereotype, like, oh, this person went to confession, and they had this, they were crying, and they had this huge like, thing of feelings. But it, for me, it wasn't like that. I didn't break down crying. I didn't, you know, it wasn't like a thing of feelings. But I understood that now things were different. Like, things are going to start over. You can start afresh. And also, the priest, as soon as I finished, he said, have you received the Eucharist today? I was like, no, it's Monday. Why would I, why would I do that? Because <laughs> I still wasn't in the mentality of you can go to daily Mass. And he said, well, come with me. If you want, you can receive the Eucharist right now. I said, yeah, I want to, <laughs> of course. Um, and so we went to the chapel, and that was the first time I, I confessed and received the Eucharist in years and years. Um, and so also on the retreat, something that helped me was a thing called the four non-negotiables that the priest had given us. Um, he said, the priest told us that there are four things that you need to live a good Christian life. And one of the most important thing about the non-negotiables is that they're non-negotiable. Mm -hmm. That means you have, to, you have to do them. You can't just say, okay, I'll do this once in a while, maybe this once a year, and that's enough. If you really want to change, you have to actually do them. Um, and those four things were daily mass, adoration, praying the rosary, and frequent confession. And so this I kind of took as my starting point and said, I'm, okay, I want to do it now, I'm going to do it. And so I started to live that, and that's really, I mean, that's where I got my strength to keep going. Because a lot of people, you can get a retreat high, like, go and you, I feel so great because I went in this retreat and I received a lot. But then you can forget about it all and lose everything. Um, but you need to be, like, close to the sacraments, you know. And so that's how I, that's how my, kind of, everything kind of changed. So you could say these four things helped you to persevere, not mm -hmm. just to have a, a moment of, joy and of change but yeah, to I mean, live it in the day to day exactly because what does it matter if it's there if it's you know one day and then you lose everything you have to keep going but for that you, I think what's most important is that you need to have an encounter with Christ because once you start a prayer life then you start to get to know him because if you're trying to be good just for the sake of being good it doesn't matter <laughs> like, that doesn't have anything behind it you know but 
it has to be I want to be good and I want to change because I love Christ. Like I have to know him. And once you know him, I think that's your motiv your motivation. You'll want to. What would you say to a young person who kind of has that thought like you did, oh, confession, confession, oh, I know what that is, but has that resistance and that, you know, I don't want to go, because it's, it's not easy to go to confession, especially when you haven't been in a long time. And oh, no, I can say I couldn't eat the entire day because I had to do the confession at 4 o'clock, and so from the time I woke up until 4 o'clock, I felt completely sick. <laughs> so, but I want to say it's worth it because your life has meaning. Like, a lot of people don't realize that the way they live is if there's nothing after they die. You know, like I thought that in high school. Why? That's what would make me cry a lot. I would say, what does it matter if I'm going to die and there's nothing? You know, like what am I living for? Do I have a purpose? Am I living for some friends who are going to leave me eventually or like things that are going to pass? You know, you have to <laughs> see that there's more. There's more to life than just, you know, things in the world that are waiting for you. But you have to take the step to do it. You have to kind of jump, you know. Yeah, sometimes you just need somebody to push you, too. Ask the Lord yeah, to push you. Yeah, sometimes push you a lot more than you think. But So after that moment, I mean, how did you end up here as a sister? Oh. <laughs> um, well, it's funny because after that, everything kind of started to move really fast. Because a week later, I was trying to, this whole week after the confession, I was like, okay, every day I'm going to Mass, I'm going to pray the Rosary, I'm going to go do adoration, and I'm going to go to confession once a week or once every two weeks, at least. Um, but it was very providential because a week after the confession, there was a festival of religious at my college. And what it is is basically they invited what seemed to me hundreds. I don't know, maybe it was just because I was so overwhelmed at the time. <laughs> um, hundreds of religious converging in my campus. And I, walked, I woke up a little late because it was Saturday, so I still wasn't living a very ordered life. Um, but I looked out of my window and there's just religious, all kinds of habits and like Franciscans and all kinds of, and I was like, what is this? What is going on? What happens to my campus? I don't see any kids. There's just like religious there. And I asked my friend, I was like, what's going on? She said, didn't you see the posters everywhere? Like there's, there's a huge festival going on. They've been advertising it for weeks. Sorry, I didn't, <laughs> I didn't realize it. But, and I thought, well, I said, I want to be good and I want to change. Well, I should go to these events that they have planned here. But I had never, I mean, never ever in my life had it crossed my mind to be a nun. And I think, I mean, ne first of all, I never thought of it. And second, you kind of have an Im image of yourself when you're in the world of, I can't be a nun, like I can't be this kind of person. I'm, I've lived how I've lived and that's what it is, you know. And nuns are born nuns and they're born in perfect little Catholic families and I'm just not like that, so I can't be. That's kind of how I, my mentality at that time. And so, I went, they had different events for the day of, of this festival. Um, and the first one I saw was a basketball game between Friars and our, our basketball team in the university. I thought, oh, that's going to be funny because the, the Friars are going to lose. <laughs> it's like really funny. I'll go to that um, because I also really liked basketball. And when I went there, there were some sisters. They were just kind of messing around with the kids and playing basketball. And I thought, oh, i never seen a nun playing basketball before. <laughs> you know, she was just shooting around. I thought it was kind of, it was kind of Okay, maybe they're not what I think they are, like, you know, women who sit in a church every, all day and pray. I thought that's what it was. But before I knew it, one of the sisters who was there, she came up to me and she said, Hey, I heard you're Filipino. Your, your friend told me you're Filipino. And I was like, oh, where's... And I looked at her, I looked at my friend, and I was like, I'm going to kill you. I'm gonna kill you. <laughs> I can't believe you did that. Because I didn't want to talk to the sister, um, just for more for shyness than anything else. And I was like, oh yeah, <laughs> that's great. You know, and she kept trying to talk to me, and I, I ran into her like three times that day, and I was thinking, what is going on here? You know, and I didn't really want to talk to her, but finally, she was trying to get me to, you know, get to know me a little bit. Um, and so I said, look, okay, I, last week I went to confession for the first time in years, and I, I received the Eucharist, and I'm kind of having a conversion, I think, and I want to change. And she was like, oh, that's great, that's great, that's great. You know, and she helped me a lot because she really encouraged me to keep going. Um, and this kind of helped break my image of nuns that I had that was kind of not, that wasn't correct. Um, and she helped, and one thing she said to me was, thank you for your yes to God. She kept saying that over and over, and I was, in my mind I said, I'm, I haven't said yes to anyone. I don't know what you're talking about, but okay. Because um, she was really nice. And so after that, there was a holy hour. Um, and the talk in the holy hour was about vocations. And I wasn't going there expecting anything about vocations. I just went to, to go pray. Um, and before I, I was, I was sitting before the Lord in the Eucharist, and all of a sudden it kind of popped into my mind the question, and what, what would happen if I asked you, like, if I wanted this for you, the vocation to be a sister, 
And I said, oh no, oh no, oh no. <laughs> and my friend was right next to me and she kind of saw me because tears started to come to my face and I was like, I can't do this. And I was, don't look at me, don't look at me, don't look at me. <laughs> Because I, I, I was, my dream was to get married. I was like, I'm, you know, I'm normal. I'm not going to be a nun. I'm going to get married and have 20 kids, you know, and be really happy. Like, it's normal. Is that normal to have 20 kids? <laughs> Probably not. They're on there, right? <laughs> <laughs> Probably not. But, you know, that was always my dream to just get married. And I, I had this, I was so set in this mentality that I said, I, I can't be anything else. I'm sorry. Maybe I'll go do mission work for a year and then get married. But a nun, no. Mm -mm. And so I left that holy hour very restless. <laughs> and, so, um, and the last thing they had that night was a festival, uh, like a music festival with the CFRs. And they also had a lot of testimonies of re different religious. And I kind of sat down in the corner because I was already not feeling very well because of the holy hour. And I was just watching everything. Um, and the sisters started to come up and give their testimonies. And it kind of impressed me because, like, you know, they're young. They're so happy. They're joyful. And they were saying things like, I wanted the greater love. I wanted, I wanted more. Like I felt God was calling me for more. And these things were touching my heart and I didn't want them to, but I was, oh no, 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 no. <laughs> um, and luckily close to me was the same priest that I confessed with. This is all very providential when I look back on it now because God always gave me the people that I needed and right in the moments when I needed them. And so I said, look, I've never, I, I talked to him and I said, I've never thought of a vocation in my life. I don't want a vocation. I don't know what to do and I'm really scared please help me <laughs> what should I do um, and he gave me some advice it was really good he said look there's two paths that you can take you can take out time to discern your vocation and if it happens that you you don't have a vocation this time is only going to prepare you better for marriage if you go to get married but if you close yourself off to the vocation and you just go right away and you say I'm going to get married and that's it well you could God could be calling you you can miss out on that you have nothing to lose if you you know if you choose to discern. So I said, okay, it makes perfect sense. Like I can't deny that, it makes sense. So I said, okay. Um, and so the, I mean, I had a period of when I was fighting, saying, no, yes, no, yes. Um, but what really helped me during that time was the life of prayer, because really it's about your relationship between, between you and the Lord. You have to, that's what you have to do is pray. And I started to, because all my life I had always decided to get married, but everything started to change. All of a sudden I kind of, so to think, oh, maybe the religious, the religious life wouldn't be that bad. One time I was saying the rosary and all that was coming into my head was the great things about religious life. I would love to be poor. Like, I would, I would love to be poor. And I was like, what are you talking about? I'm like, are you serious? Like, you don't even know anything about the religious life. But it was kind of little things like that that the Lord is planting in my heart. Um, and so later there was another retreat for Holy Week. And what I, I can't really explain what happened in those months between that festival, the religious festival and the Holy Week, but I mean, I fell completely in love with the Lord because I, I just wanted, all my desires changed. I stopped being with my friends. My friends would see, they would see me and be like, where have you been? I haven't seen you in three weeks. And like, sorry, I just had stuff to do. It's because I was in the chapel reading the books about saints because I wanted to be like them and I wanted to be a religious. I was like, sorry, I just have to go. I don't have time for these. I have to go. Sorry. You know, like that's how it was. Everything started to change. And so, I mean, it was God showing me in these like little things that I had to be totally for him. And so I went on this on the Holy Week retreat and I still was kind of unsure. And I'd seen the sisters, the, the sisters who, the servant sisters, <laughs> um, they were running the retreat and I talked to them there and I kind of got to know them a little bit more. And one of them invited me to go to Spain for the summer because they have a house where you could, girls can go, families can go. Um, and some people go to discern their vocation. And so I remember that day it was Holy Saturday. It was one of the happiest days of my life because I just remember being so filled with joy because I had decided that I'm gonna go, I'm gonna take the risk, I'm gonna buy a ticket to Spain, I'm gonna go, it doesn't matter, I just have to do this. And it's funny because I was never a person who was very decisive and I was also usually a, more of a homebody. Like I would never, I never had the desire to go out of my country. A lot of people wanna go to Europe and see all these things. I was like, no, I'm fine here, and, you know, like I'm fine. But for this, it was like, you don't understand, I have to go to Spain. And I have to go. I don't have money, but I have to go. My passport isn't renewed, but I have to go. <laughs> like I only have a month to renew my passport. But I decided to do it. And providentially, the money just like fell into my hands all of a sudden. And my passport, which shouldn't have come through, came through a week before I had to leave. And so <laughs> for, through, through Providence, I ended up in Spain in the summer. And that's where I knew that I had to enter. And I entered as a servant sister that summer.
But just like Sister Rachel said, sometimes we go to prayer and we're just before the Lord and you say, speak to me, Lord, speak to me, Lord, but we're there with our ears plugged, you know, like with our fingers, with whatever we can find, just speak to me, but don't, but, but like the second retreat she went to, just giving that, giving the Lord that little bit, that little bit, just opening up just a little bit more. And if we're truly sincere with the Lord, He'll start speaking to our heart and, and changing our lives. And, and when we just kind of surrender that to Him and open up to His will, we totally change the track we were on to a, a better path. So thank you all for watching and we will see you next time.